First time I met our speaker of the hour, was in the book room of the educational building of the Knight Arnold congregation in 1993. I was impressed with him at that moment, wondering why a 13-year-old was coming to school. I say that because Cliff always has looked so young to me. Then one day he introduced me to his fiance and I thought, what are a 14 and 13 year old doing getting married? <laughs> I'm impressed with him another way though. Not only does he have a young face, he has an ancient person's wisdom. The first time I heard him speak in chapel, I said to him afterwards, you took one of Brother Winfrey Clark's outlines and did it very well. Cliff got a tear in his eye. He said, Brother Moses, that was my outline. And he was right. Here was a 19-year-old preaching as if he were 40 years old. If you've ever heard Cliff, you know what I'm mentioning at this moment. His wife and Beth are native Alabamians. They have a son, Cade, two daughters, Kenley and Lakeland. Cliff graduated from this school in 1995 and Faulkner University in 1997. He works with the Aronitan Church of Christ. Cliff, have you been there 20 years? Is that right? 20 years. And uh, they have a great and wonderful work there. He has, if you've watched Gospel Broadcast Network at all, you've seen Cliff Goodwin. Uh, you've known that he has been in gospel meetings all over the place. He's the host of a program on GBN called Preaching the Gospel. What time is that on? Do you have any idea? 6.30 Central. 6.30 Central. That is a great and wonderful program. And you are going to be treated to a great and wonderful lesson today. As Cliff speaks to us, don't be a hope killer. The last thing I wanted to do was to spill my water on Brother Moser's lectureship book. <laughs> I, I didn't want to do that. <laughs> I do want to say at the outset, and I don't often make uh, remarks by way of preface, but I do want to say here today that I will be forever indebted to the Memphis School of Preaching to Brother Mosier and to all of my instructors under or at whose feet I sat for some two years. I tell people with a smile and yet I say it sincerely that my two-year tenure in the Memphis School of Preaching was the best two years of my unmarried life. <laughs> and they were the best two years of my unmarried life. And Beth and I, my dear wife, we have often spoken together expressing to each other how that we wish that she could have gone through those two years with me. Uh, but I was not blessed to even know her at that time. And so that did not work out. But I'm very indebted to this school and very grateful for all that Memphis School of Preaching means to me and even more so to the kingdom of our Lord upon this earth. Take your Bibles and open them with me now as we consider the topic, Don't Be a Hope Killer. Don't Be a Hope Killer. Now what I'm about to offer, I offer in love. But I do so by way of experience and observation. I mean no malice when I say this. But in love, I do want to offer this because perhaps, just perhaps, there might be some sitting in our audience this morning to whom these words could prove helpful. And that is, it has been my experience that from time to time we encounter individuals who could rightly be styled hope 
killers. And I say that because of habitual negativity. I say that because of overarching cynicism or criticism. I say that because of an overall attitude of defeatism. Brethren, I think it's very important that you and I who are New Testament Christians, that we understand and that we embrace the reality that the victory has already been won. Revelation 17 and verse 14. There is no doubt as to the outcome of this struggle. The only question remaining, therefore, is on whose side will you be found? On whose side will I be counted? That's the only question. The victory is already the Lord's. Now that being said, for those of us who are blessed beyond measure to be the elect, to be citizens in this heavenly kingdom, there is no place, therefore. There is no place for negativity, for pessimism, or for defeatism. I could not take the remainder of this time and fully enumerate to you how much an attitude of defeatism has harmed the Lord's church even in the past century. So many brethren sitting back saying, we can't, we won't, we shouldn't, we must not. When all the while the Lord's marching orders are forward. Go forward. Brethren, let's not be hope killers. Instead, let's hurl, or unhurl rather, the banner of the cross and let's move ahead in hope. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 3, the Apostle Paul began that verse by saying, Knowing therefore your work of faith and labor of love and patience, better word would be endurance, a better word would be steadfastness, perseverance, your patience of hope. Even as faith produces work, even as love can produce labor, Likewise, hope produces patience, endurance, that inner resolve wherewith a man or a woman is able to forbear, to stand up, and to endure whatever trials, whatever temptations might beset him or her. Hope produces that kind of inner strength. That kind of endurance. But not only does it produce patience, it also produces purity. In 1 John 3 and verse 3, the apostle of love would write, And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he, referring to our Lord, even as he himself is pure. And so hope is a motivating factor in our lives. It motivates us not only to endure and to keep on keeping on, as we commonly say, but hope also reminds us of the importance of the reward. It reminds us of that which is lying ever before us. And therefore, it impresses upon us the need for purity. As James would say, every one of us should keep ourselves unspotted from this wicked world. James 1 and verse 27. And it's because of the hope of heaven. It's because of hope that you and I are motivated to remain pure, not only in the sight of men, but most importantly to remain pure in the sight of God. No wonder then, no wonder then, in Romans 8, 24 and 25, we read, For we are saved by hope. <laughs> Isn't that strange? I mean, often we would say we're saved by grace, Ephesians 2 and verse 8. We might say that we are saved by Christ, Acts 4 and verse 12. We might even mention the blood of Christ that washes us from our sins, Revelation 1, 5. And yes, we need to mention the church of Christ in which and with whom we are saved, Ephesians 5 and verse 23. But in Romans 8, 24 and 25, Paul says we are saved by hope, hope. Why would you and I want to be a hope killer? 
Why would we desire to extinguish in any way or to any extent that by which we are saved? Romans 8. Don't be a hope killer. No, don't be a hope killer. Be a hope kindler, if you will. Kindle the flames of hope. Don't kill or extinguish those flames. Now that being said, I want to share with you three points during the balance of our time this morning. Three points, and then having discussed each of these points, we're going to take away a basic lesson from each point, one by one. Point number one, consider with me, don't undermine faith. Don't undermine faith. You don't need me to stand before you here today and to tell or inform you that we're living in a time and in a society that is growing increasingly secular. You don't need me to tell you that. You know that. Unbelief rages. Atheism, skepticism, infidelity of various stripes and ilks, they abound seemingly on every hand. You know that and I know that. But as God's children, we ought to do all that we can, therefore, to nurture faith, to cultivate faith, not only in our own hearts, but in the lives and in the hearts of those around us with whom we come in contact. We, we don't want to sow seeds of skepticism, seeds of doubt. We don't want to undermine faith in any way Whatsoever, Because I'm here to tell you today, if you undermine a person's faith, you will prove to be a hope killer. A hope killer. Consider with me some passages. In Titus 1 and verse 2, the Apostle Paul penned by inspiration, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie, God cannot lie. The Hebrews author would say it is impossible for God to lie, Hebrews 6, 18 and 19. Which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. God has promised us the hope of eternal life one day in heaven, Colossians 1 and verse 5, not on a so-called rejuvenated earth. The Bible knows nothing of that doctrine. But our hope lies in heaven, eternal life in heaven. John so wrote in 1 John 2 and verse 25 that this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. Brothers and sisters, the reason that you and I do not undermine faith and we cannot undermine faith is because faith is connected to the very character of God. Because God is who He is. Because God is light in whom is no darkness. 1 John 1 and verse 5. God cannot lie. And because of that spiritual reality, you and I, we nurture faith. We encourage faith. We promote faith, not only by our words, but also by our deeds, by our examples, because God will not and cannot lie. And God has promised eternal life to those who love Him, to those who are called according to His purpose. James 1 and verse 12, Romans 8 and verse 28. Now direct your attention to Hebrews 11 and verse 1. In Hebrews 11, 1, we read the following. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The reason we do not want to undermine faith so as to become a hope killer is found very clearly in this verse. Faith and hope are inextricably linked. Faith and hope. In 1611, when the King James Version was completed, the word substance back then was much more literal than it is today. Today, we might use the word substance to speak of essence or to speak of composition, but not so 400 or so years ago. Substance meant literally that which stands under, sub, substance. Faith is that which stands under, as if it were a bulwark or a pillar. Faith is that which stands under hope. 
The things hoped for. You rob men and women of their faith in Almighty God and you have extinguished their hope. You have taken away their hope. Without God, there is no hope. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. Not yet, but they will be. Go with me now to 2 Timothy 1, beginning at verse 8. 2 Timothy 1, verse 8. Paul would write, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. You know, Paul wrote these words as a prisoner. He wrote these words this time as a prisoner who would not be released ultimately. Okay, the tone and the tenor of 2 Timothy is completely different from the tone and the tenor of Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon. Completely different. Paul was optimistic, and there's evidence of that. In Philemon, for example, verse 19 and following, or verses 20 through 22, prepare me a lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be delivered unto you. No such idea here in 2 Timothy. Instead, in chapter 4, he would write, for the time of my departure is at hand. It's at hand. And yet this man facing basically a death sentence, he tells Timothy, Timothy, step up to the plate. Come on, step up to the plate. Don't be ashamed of me. Don't be ashamed of my afflictions. Don't be ashamed of what would be your afflictions, Timothy. Be not thou therefore ashamed... Step up to the plate. Be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Verse 9. This God who hath saved us. This God who hath called us with an holy calling. Not according to our own works. Frankly speaking, brethren, not because you and I were such good people. We weren't. We weren't. And the fact of the matter is, apart from the gospel, we still wouldn't be. Not according to our own works, no, but according to His own purpose, His grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Timothy, step up to the plate. Here Paul is facing the sentence of death. You cannot extinguish Paul's hope. You can kill Paul, but you can't take away his hope. And he's telling Timothy, you step on up here, Timothy. Verse 10. But is now made manifest. That is, God's purpose, alluded to or not alluded to, mentioned in verse 9, is now made manifest, clearly known, by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, this is what I want you to emphasize for today's study. The last portion of verse 10. This Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death, He's abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light. You know, something that's brought to light is visible. Something that's brought to light is attainable. Something that is brought to light can be seen and recognized and realized. Our Lord has brought to light life, L-I-F-E, and immortality, ceaseless life. Eternal life through the gospel. Those last three words. Through the gospel. Don't undermine faith. Don't undermine faith. Number one, faith is connected to the character of God. It's connected to the character of God. I believe because God cannot lie. Number two, faith is produced by the gospel. This saving message of Jesus Christ that has brought life and immortality to light so that you and I and all of us can know it. We can not only know it, we can embrace it. That's the gospel. Peter would write in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 25, he would say, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel was preached unto you. Brothers and sisters, you cannot separate the gospel from the word. And without the word, you don't have the gospel. This is the word which by the gospel was preached unto you. What does this gospel do? It brings life and immortality to light. How can I be a hope killer? 
How could I be a hope killer? There's too much that's been revealed. There's too much that's been given. It's interesting you stay in the same context. 1 Peter chapter 1. And you back up to verses 20 and 21 and you notice this connection. 1 Peter 1, 20. Who verily, referring to Jesus Christ, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest, a word we just saw in 2 Timothy 1, manifest, made clearly known. Jesus was foreordained before God said, let there be light, Genesis 1, 3. But now he's been made clearly known in these last times, this last age, the Christian age. Jesus has been made clearly known for you and for me. Verse 21, who by him, now get this, by Jesus Christ, you and I have been made to believe in God. That raised him up from the dead and gave him glory. God, why did you do this? That your faith and your hope might be in me. Notice, faith and what? Faith and hope might be in me. Lord, why should I put my faith and my hope in you? Why, God? Because I have raised my son from the dead. And friends, this gospel preaches that. Verse 25. My dad used to say that when this world is on fire, the truth will still stand. The word of the Lord endureth forever. Don't undermine faith. Don't undermine faith. Now here's the lesson number one that comes from that point number one. That's the point. Don't undermine faith. Here's the lesson. Point people to the Bible. Instead of being a hope killer, if you and I would be hope nurturers, if you and I would be hope cultivators, we need to point people to the Bible. It is in the Bible that the character of God is clearly revealed and clearly seen. It is in the Bible that the gospel message is recorded without error, without mistake. It's recorded right there in God's Word. It is from the Bible that you and I produce faith in our hearts. God produces faith in our hearts through the power of His Word. Romans 10 and verse 17. So long as we submit to it. Hebrews 4 and verse 2. Point people to the Bible is takeaway number one. Now, let's move to point number two. We've discussed don't undermine faith. Now let's discuss don't underestimate the atonement. Don't underestimate the atonement. Folks, we live in a world that's lost. We live in a world that's dying we live in a world that is headed to hell. And I don't say that profanely. I say that sincerely. We live in the midst of a lost and dying world. A world that desperately needs hope. And there is hope. But you and I cannot underestimate the atonement of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, if you and I cease believing that Jesus died for every single man and woman then we're already beginning to kill hope. We're already beginning to put out hope's flame. Let's start this point by discussing the attitude of God, the attitude of the Father. Often when we preach concerning attitudes, we point such discussions to ourselves as men and women, and we should. But I'd like to say just a little about the attitude of God. In 1 Timothy 2 and verse 4, speaking of our God, it is said, Who will, that is, it is His will, Thelo, His will, His desire, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Friends, maybe we need to be reminded of that reality. Maybe before we prejudge some sinner, maybe before we decide for ourselves that he wouldn't be interested in the gospel or, or she wouldn't be interested in the gospel, maybe before we determine in our own human wisdom that this gospel wouldn't appeal to him or her in any way, maybe we just need to be reminded that God wants that man, God wants that woman to go to heaven. That's God's attitude. 
And not only in 1 Timothy 2, 4 is that his will, he's also revealed therein, or Paul does by inspiration, the means whereby God intends to do that. By their coming unto a knowledge of the truth. You and I cannot sit back on our thumbs or on our hands and expect truth somehow just to dissipate into the hearts or disseminate into the hearts of these men and women. You and I are bearers of the truth. Are we not? Absolutely we are. God's attitude is that they be saved. Now are you and I going to teach them the truth? Next in 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness. No, but God is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You take the use of the words any and all, and you have an open and shut case. When you have the negative, not any, and then you have the positive, all, guess who that leaves out? Leaves out nobody. Leaves out nobody. Hear me. Nobody. Now don't you underestimate the atonement. Don't underestimate the atonement. And please don't keep the atonement from anyone else. Don't keep the saving message that is from anyone else. We need to appreciate the attitude of God. But now let's direct our attention to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 2. It's remarkable as you go through the book of Hebrews... Obviously, the emphasis on Jesus Christ, you and I know that. But it's also remarkable to me the statements we find from time to time concerning the atoning work of Jesus Christ and the scope, the scope of that work, the breadth of that work. In Hebrews 2 and verse 9, but we see Jesus. We need to see Jesus more. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels. You can't kill a spirit. God is a spirit, John 4, 24. Jesus is God, John 1, 1 through 3. He had to become a man. Angels are spirits, Hebrews 1 and verse 14. He couldn't even have become an angel. He had to become a man to be killed. He was made a little lower than the angels. Why? For the suffering of death, Romans 6, 23. Those are the wages of sin, death. Jesus had to die. Crowned with glory and honor, probably a statement indicative of his sinless perfection. The second Adam was the only one since the first Adam who in an adult state had been sinlessly perfect. Adam did not retain his. Adam did not keep his. The second Adam did. Crowned with glory and honor. That he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. If that doesn't fire you up, what does? If that doesn't fire you up, every... Stay in Hebrews. Go with me to chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. You drink too much water, it comes out through your eyes. <laughs> Let that be a warning to you, okay? Watch that. Hebrews 7, 25. Wherefore, he, Jesus, is able also. He is what? He is able. Don't you say that Jesus is unable when the Bible inspiration has said he's able. Don't let your actions practically say that he is unable when the Bible has already said he is able. Don't do that. Don't underestimate the atonement. Don't keep it from somebody because you've prejudged them. Don't do that. Somebody told me a long time ago that when we preach the gospel to a man or a woman, we allow them to make the decision. But when you and I refuse or neglect to preach the gospel to a man or a woman, we have already made that decision for them. And buddy, that is something on the day of judgment you and I don't want to consider. We don't want to consider that. He is able also to save them to the uttermost. I can't even go into that word. You need to study that word. You need to study that word. 
He is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by Him. Now that's the catch, if you want to call it a catch. That's the requirement. That's the condition. Those are far better words. He can save all, but He will only save those who come unto God by Him. John 14, 6. Seeing He ever lives to make intercession for them. Friends, the Calvinist nightmare is 1 John 2 and verse 2. <laughs> and he is the propitiation for our sins. Our? Who would that be? That's obviously the elect. That's obviously John and his brothers and sisters. That's obviously the church for which Jesus died. He is the propitiation for our sins. But then the Holy Spirit presses onward. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Satan hates that. Calvinism denies that. But you and I, we proclaim that. We preach that. Titus 2 and verse 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Don't underestimate the atonement. You do that and you're a hope killer. You do that and you're a hope killer. Sometime back, and I, I can't judge any man or any man's heart, but sometime back years ago, many of us, you and I, we heard about Jeffrey Dahmer's obedience to the gospel. I was thankful for that. I was thankful for that. Some of my brethren almost acted repulsed when you told them, as if Jeffrey Dahmer was beyond the pale of redemption. Brethren, you need to stop and think about this. If God cannot or will not save Jeffrey Dahmer, how do you know God can or will save you? Don't be a hope killer. Don't underestimate the atonement. Now, here's our second lesson. Okay, we've noticed two points. Here's our second lesson corresponding to the second point. Point people to the cross. Number one, we learn point people to the Bible. This is spiritual truth. This is what they've got to know right here. Point them to the Bible. But now point number two or lesson number two, point people to the cross. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. Point people to the cross. And you know what you'll do thereby? You'll nurture hope. You'll kindle the flames of hope. <laughs> Don't be a hope killer. Point number three, our final point for this hour. Don't undergird life with the temporal. Don't undergird life with the temporal. We've noticed, don't undermine faith. Don't underestimate the atonement. But now in closing, don't undergird life with the temporal, the material, the physical. You know, this must be one of man's most ancient problems. And I say that as we turn our attention to the book of Job, Job chapter 31, because there's great evidence suggesting that the book of Job is perhaps the most ancient of all the books in our Bible. Now, you and I understand that the events recorded in Genesis take us back earlier the events in Genesis take us back to the very beginning. But as far as when Job was written down initially, it likely predated when Moses ever sat and wrote Genesis through Deuteronomy. There's great possibility. This is the oldest book in God's Word, the book of Job. And yet look back to this ancient time, probably most likely patriarchy. Look back to the words of this notable patriarch Job who said in Job 31 and verse 24, If I have made gold my hope, or have said to the fine gold, Thou art my confidence. If I rejoice because my wealth was great, and because my hand had gotten much. 
Now, we're reading these if statements, these conditional statements, but the idea is, and as Job makes his famous defense here in chapter 31, the idea is that if I have done these things or any of the other things he catalogs in this chapter, the idea is I would be guilty before God. I would be guilty, Job says, if I had made gold my hope. Friends, this is an ancient problem. This is an ancient problem because uh, not only in patriarchy, not only under Judaism, but as we turn back now to 1 Timothy in the New Testament, Christianity, obviously. Paul would tell Timothy in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 17, charge them. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded. If we place our hope in material things, we have a tendency to condescend and to look down our noses at others. That they be not high-minded, number two, nor trust in uncertain riches. Build your hopes on things eternal. Trust in Him who will not leave you. But these trust in uncertain riches. Number three, instead trust in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. And he goes on to say that they do good, that they be rich in good works, that they be ready to distribute, willing to communicate, ready to give, willing to share laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Now, friends, we might not think about this, and perhaps for many of us here today, this might be the most perilous problem. We, we don't want to undermine faith. We would never do that consciously. We, we would never underestimate the atonement, but if we're not careful, we might undergird life with the temporal. And friends, we say so much more by our example than what we ever say by our words. We can get up and we can preach the fleeting nature of riches, the fleeting nature of all these things, Proverbs 23, verses 4 and 5. And yet, if in our actions and in our attitudes we're materialistic, we're short-sighted, we're laying up treasure now instead of laying up treasure in heaven, Matthew 6, 19 through 21. I'll tell you where our example can prove the most devastating. And that's with our own children in our own homes. They might hear daddy preach from time to time that, that the love of money is the root of all evil. They might hear daddy preach that. But then Monday through Saturday, they see mama's and daddy's attitude toward money. And you know what? You're killing hope. You're killing hope. <laughs> You're raising a generation of greedy, materialistic, earthly-minded kids. They have no spiritual hope. Don't undergird life with the temporal. You know why? Because our inheritance, according to Peter, in 1 Peter 1 and verse 4, to an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. First Peter 1 and verse 4. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And those men, those women have hope. They have not undergirded their lives with the temporal. And so in closing, this is lesson number three. Point people to heaven. Lesson number one, point people to the Bible. You'll be a hope nurturer. Lesson number two, point people to the cross. You'll be a hope kindler. Lesson number three, point people to heaven. You'll be a hope cultivator. But by all means, don't be a hope 
killer. Thank you.